This will be the first part of our photosynthesis videos. And in these videos, we will look at and examine how photosynthesis is able to produce sugar uh, in plants and in some bacteria. And this is for IB sections 2.9 and 8.3, and this is for the 2016 exam material. And in this first video, we're kind of going to introduce what photosynthesis is, kind of a quick overview of what's happening, and, look, and then look at some conditions that can affect the rates of photosynthesis and how we can measure photosynthesis. And so really the, the process of photosynthesis is the conversion of light energy into chemical energy. And you probably have seen some sort of image like this or have a basic understanding of what's happening in photosynthesis from previous biology classes. Plants, specifically the leaf tissue, takes in sunlight, takes in carbon dioxide, a little bit of water and is able to produce oxygen and sugar. And so whether we eat those plants or whether we eat something that is eating those plants, we're getting our energy from producers, from plants and bacteria that are producers, making their own energy. So sunlight is composed of a range of wavelengths, uh, red, blue, and green. And this sunlight is what provides the energy for plants to actually make their sugars. The chlorophyll is a pigment uh, that is the primary photosynthetic pigment, meaning that it's the the receptor of the of this sunlight and of the different colors and there's different types of pigment. Um, chlorophyll happens to actually absorb the red and blue light in plant um, in the sunlight most effectively. And the reason that plant material is most often green is because that green light is actually being reflected. It's what we see. And so the red and the blue is what's being absorbed. The green is reflected. And so to kind of simplify this process um, of photosynthesis, light energy is used to produce ATP, a small amount of ATP, not as much as what we see in cellular respiration in aerobic conditions. Uh, that light energy then is used to split water molecules, uh, it's a process called photolysis, and form oxygen and hydrogen. The ATP and the hydrogen are used to fix carbon dioxide to make organic molecules. And so energy is needed to make these organic molecules, these carbohydrates, and it's, this process is endothermic reaction, meaning it requires energy. And that energy, in order to drive that process, is obtained from absorbing sunlight. And the sunlight actually helps to cause all of this process to actually happen, to allow this chemical energy to be made. And so here's a diagram that shows us the overall kind of process of cellular, uh, excuse me, of, of photosynthesis. It's divided into two different parts. And so as we saw in cellular respiration in our previous videos for this unit, there were a number of different steps that occurred in order to produce ATP. Similar in photosynthesis, but there's only two primary steps. And the first is called the light dependent reactions, meaning that light is required. And the second is the light independent reactions, meaning light is not required. And you can see there are some different inputs and outputs for both of these different steps. In the light dependent reactions, water and sunlight is necessary. It produces in those steps O2 as well as ATP and NADPH. And those are used in the light independent reactions where CO2 is used to make sucrose or sugars. Now all of this is happening in the organelle called a chloroplast. And Within the chloroplast, there are a number of different par uh, parts and structures. We'll look at these a little bit more in detail later. But similar to the mitochondria, chloroplasts have their own DNA. They have their own ribosomes. They have an, uh, their own membrane. Um, and so they have very many of the same types of structures that a cell does. And again, this is one of the pieces of evidence that supports the endosymbiotic theory of advanced cells or eukaryote. Uh, evolution. We'll look at these different structures a little bit more as we get into the process of photosynthesis in more detail and in our coming videos. Let's first now look then at some of the different ways that we can measure the rates of photosynthesis and some of the limiting factors. And the rate of photosynthesis can be measured by the production of oxygen, the uptake of carbon dioxide, or an increase in plant biomass. And as we, as you probably know and as we saw in one of the previous images in the video, Photosynthesis results, one of the byproducts of it is oxygen, and it takes in carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is an input, oxygen is. And so then obviously, oxygen is produced as an output, and we can measure this, uh, the amount of oxygen that is output during the process of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, and we can measure this uh, in, a, in a quantifiable way. And one of the easiest ways to do this is using a veneer uh, scientific probe, and we can measure the amount of oxygen that is released in a closed environment. 
Secondly, the rate of photosynthesis can be measured by the amount of CO2 that is taken in. CO2 is required for those plants, um, uh, chloroplasts specifically, to make uh, carbohydrates, to make glucose. And so you can also, using a probe such as a veneer probe or other types of probes, uh, scientific measurement probes, detect the amount of CO2 that is in a closed environment. So CO2 would be expected then to decrease as photosynthesis is taking place. Photosynthesis can also be measured by the production of oxygen, uptake of carbon dioxide, or lastly, in the increase in plant biomass. And so plants can be harvested at, at a continual rate in order to calculate biomass. And this can provide an indirect measure of the rate of photosynthesis. Now this would obviously be a very difficult way to calculate the rate of photosynthesis. Um, one, because it would take longer than just measuring CO2 or O2 outputs, inputs and outputs. And it would also be difficult to separate um, the actual plant biomass tissue, the amount of plants from the soil or other things that would be connected to it. So this would be a little bit more of a difficult way to measure the rate of photosynthesis, but it is possible. Now a couple different things can kind of influence the, uh, the rate of photosynthesis, some limiting factors. And these different factors that are affecting photosynthesis would include light intensity, temperature, and CO2. And a limiting factor is some sort of reactant or input um, that is available in, in short supply, and so the reaction is limited. And so these three things, light intensity, temperature, and CO2, can limit how quickly photosynthesis can occur. So let's take a look at temperature. The temperature can influence the rate of photosynthesis, and as the temperature increases, it causes the rate of photosynthesis to increase up into a point. And so what we're seeing happily, uh, happen is there's a, a steep increase uh, until it reaches that optimum temperature, op optimum temperature, and then after that temperature, or once that temperature is passed, the rate decreases rapidly. And this can be explained, as we looked at earlier in the year, as temperature increases, it causes those molecules to move around more quickly. And so the molecules that are used uh, in the process of photosynthesis are, are having a greater chance, because they're moving faster, of interacting with the enzymes necessary to perform photosynthesis. Well, at those increased temperatures, those enzymes are going to start to denature or break down. That's what denature means. And so if those enzymes start to break down, then obviously they can't perform their functions. And so then the rate of photosynthesis decreases rather quickly. The second factor would be light intensity. And this would be an increase of uh, photosynthesis up into a certain point. As the amount of light increases, the rate of photosynthesis will increase up into a specific point. There eventually will get to be a point where there's not, it's not able to speed up anymore as the light intensity increases. And actually, as sometimes seen in experiments in my classroom, if there's too much light, it can actually cause the plant to burn, which obviously would not be very good for the plant. Um, at optimum intensity, photosynthesis rate plateaus, and it doesn't increase any further. And so you can see that rate increasing up into a specific point, uh, very similar to what we will see with a uh, populations carrying capacity when we get to ecology. The rate of photosynthesis is proportional to the intensity at low and medium light levels. And so at these lower or medium light levels, the rate of photosynthesis is going to be proportional. Uh, obviously, when it gets to its highest levels, it will plateau. The third condition is focusing on carbon dioxide. And with an increase of carbon dioxide, there's an increase uh, of photosynthesis up into a certain point. And this is uh, somewhat similar to the light intensity. Uh, if there is lots of carbon dioxide available, or as the amount of carbon dioxide increases, photosynthesis will increase because there will be uh, chloroplasts and enzymes within those chloroplasts to be able to accept the carbon dioxide and to speed up the process. Well, eventually, if that amount of carbon dioxide continues to increase and increase and increase, it will eventually get to a point where there's too much carbon dioxide for the amount of binding sites for that carbon dioxide and for the amount of enzymes. And so there, there will be an excess of carbon dioxide and there's not enough um, enzymes and different components that are used in photosynthesis to be able to take advantage of all of that CO2. And so eventually that level, that increase, will eventually plateau as we've seen here in this, in this graph. Um, one of the things that's important to note though is that photosynthesis can't occur at low levels of carbon dioxide. So if there's not enough carbon dioxide, the process can't even begin. What we'll do in the next couple videos, and then in part two, we will look at the light dependent reactions, and in part three, we'll look at the light independent reactions, as well as cover a little bit more specifically the different uh, structures of the chloroplast molecule in our coming videos.